hole itself, uh, it, uh, this part, this quarry started in 1974, although there's been quarrying in and around Mount Sorrel village since Roman times. Um, it started, believe it or not, as a hill. I was wondering that, yeah. So um, the, uh, it was known as Budden Wood, and the, uh, the wood itself, uh, which was clear felled during the war, um, is now a site of special scientific interest, the, the bit that's left round the outside. Nowadays, they all used to have things like rope ladders to get up and down them, and we can see sort of proper access stairs on them now. I've seen to somebody the uh, sort of air, all air conditioned and uh, um, really pretty nice inside the cabs. Uh, um, and uh, we've still got another 100 metres vertically to go down yet to get to the bottom. So the bottom of the quarry is about 120 metres below sea level. So we know there's lots of granite. Um, are uh, the challenge we face is um, being able to continue to extract the granite and uh, ensure that we do that in a responsible way so that we don't impact upon our local community. Um, and that's more than just the residents. Obviously we've got Triple SI around us, we've got um, uh, the, the whole of the charm. You know, you go up onto the beacon, you go up into Bradgate Park and you look back across this way, so um, it's, it's noise, dust, vibration, but it's also visual impact we, we well. Realistically, we can only probably go about another 100 metres down with, unless there's some change in energy, because um, <clears throat> the fuel bill just to get the granite out is just, you know, it's a million quid a, a year now. Um, so we'll have a, uh, we'll, I'll let you get out here just because I think it's a good place to get an idea of the scale of the place. advantage with, with having a quarry that's so deep um, is that for a very small amount of area, so I think uh, for every square metre we get some, something like about 6 million tonnes out, yeah. out on the ground, it's incredible sort of 200 yeah. metres down. Yeah. So abrasive, that these, these buckets, we have two machines exactly the same and um, you see on the bucket it's got lots of strips of, uh, of steel and the teeth. Um, we have uh, every night uh, we have two men and all they do is just weld more steel onto the bucket and replace teeth. And they do one bucket one night, the other bucket the next night and then back to this bucket the, next, the third night. So uh, it's like painting the fourth row bridge. Um, but that Here. Uh, over on our left you've got all the, these are all our workshops, um, so they become a hive of activity at night as 
everything's uh, prepared and uh, maintained during the night, uh, ready for the next day. Um, and then over on our right, this uh, conveyor you can see next to us, this is where all the fine material comes off. So everything that's gone through the primary crushers goes into the building, where it goes over the screens that we could just see on the camera, on the monitor in the control room. All the fine materials dropped on the pile here. And all the uh, clean material goes off the big conveyor with the flags flying. Uh, that's the conveyor that you can see from the A6. Um, and that uh, creates a big stockpile, up to 140,000 tonne of material on there. And that, um, that allows us to operate everything we've seen so far completely independently of everything that's coming. So, uh, two tipping points to keep the trucks turning around so the trucks never stop. So the main shaft, you can see a spare shaft in the background and over in the uh, yeah, yes. workshop. Yes. Um, we change that every three million tons. Um, and, uh, and then the bits around the outside, what we call the concaves, um, which are also manganese, uh, we change them every two years. So there's a hundred tons being tipped in at a time. It all goes through here and, and gets crushed, drops into a massive room underneath here. And then at the very underneath that roof, there's some holes in the bottom. Our main product is railway ballast, so if there's um if something's still too big for railway ballast, which is generally about 50 millimetres in size, we send it back to the crushers. If for some reason there's a ballast train been cancelled, we can re-crush it and make other products. Um, and uh, we keep sending material to around that building until we get the products we want. That's um, stockpile. Um, um, fairly obvious reasons. Um, and uh, there's a conveyor on the top of this which allows us to put uh, products into each one of these bays. Um, <clears throat> this side we don't use because literally the other side of that fence there's uh, houses. Um, and uh, <clears throat> But each bay does hold a different product. And um, for every product we're able to blend all these different bays together in any combination you can think of um, to create whatever recipe somebody wants. So uh, underneath the, every bay there are four conveyors that come out from underneath and um, we blend whatever anybody wants and send it. Uh, first of all we can send it out and across the road in front of us down the conveyor on the left and that goes three miles across the valley to barrow upon saw and straight into the back of the trains. Um, so this is our main way bridge just here. Um, we actually have... Uh, six way bridges um, just to cope with the volume of demand uh, at busy times um, and then uh, over on our right in the big long building there that's our uh, our main laboratory just for this site um, so we do a lot of our own testing of materials from uh, simple gradings to moisture contents to uh, skid resistance for uh, for the roads 